we are going to take off where we left off. Some of you were here, right? And we're dealing with the battle of the ages. Something that we are not hearing much about in the church world today as it used to be. So God decided to use me to bring it back and to snap us out of sleep. Okay? I want to give you a passage here. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Okay, we're going over there. And we're going to work with that. Our brother, the Apostle Paul, was dealing with this. Would you stand, brother? Paul had a lot to say here about this. And we're going to look at the 12th verse. I'm sure that passage is very familiar with some of you, right? Okay, listen at what it says. For we, the we is the born again believer, okay? Wrestle not. He gave us a disclaimer saying we're not wrestling with people. Flesh and blood is symbolic of other people. Now he tells us who we are literally in a war with. Principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now he says, wherefore, meaning because of who we are fighting, this is a warning. Take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And we will have those days. And when you've done everything you know to do, to stand. In the 14th verse, he says, I'm giving you no excuses. Stand, therefore. Then he says, having our loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. He says, put on some boots. Get your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. And above all of that which I've said, you must take the shield of faith. And he tells you why. Wherewith, meaning with this, ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Then put on a hat, the helmet of salvation. Get a weapon inside of your sheath, the sword of of the spirit and he says the sword is the word of God you can be saying amen he had a whole lot to say now thank you if the man of God is ministering about weapons then there must be something else involved with the weapon can you agree with that? Now, if you don't agree, I agree with it. And I'll show you that. Let's take a peek at something else. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. And let's see what the man of God is saying down here. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Let's see. Notice what he says. He's talking about war. 
So he says, no man that warreth entangleth himself, that means you girls too, with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be what? What are we? The church is God's army. We march to a different beat from the world. For those that don't know that, look at Ephesians. Give me Ephesians 2.2, 2, my brother. Ephesians 2.2. 2. And watch, watch what the man of God says here. He says, in times past, we walked according to the course of this world. In other words, we live like everybody else. According to the prince of the power of the air, meaning we were being dominated by Satan. He is the prince of the power of the air. Meaning he was our illegal stepfather when we weren't saved. Then he calls him the spirit that now worketh in who? the children of disobedience, okay? Let, let's go to something else. Let's look at, <clears throat> excuse me, 2 Timothy 4 through 6 this time, and not just 4, okay? 4 through 6. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be what? Turn to what? How many of you believe that? Hmm? Do you believe that? Two. Now go to two. Second Timothy two. Two and four. We're in that day now when people who love God and believe God was walking with God. Many are dropping by the wayside. And if you think they're just falling, then you don't understand the Bible. They're not just falling. They're being knocked down. Now he says, go to the next verse, the fifth verse. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. Now go to the next verse. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. All right? We're putting all that together. We're saying something here. Paul talks in Ephesians 6 about wrestling. Now he talks about warfare and how we ought to do it legally. And then there's a whole lot more to go with this here. Colossians 2.15, would you go there, please? All I'm doing here is showing you your identity. That's all. Your true identity. That's Colossians 2 and 15. This is about us, us. We have called ourselves some names over the years, like I'm a sinner saved by grace. Is that really what you are? Believe it or not, millions believe that. Millions of Christians believe they are a sinner saved by grace. Now, it sounds good. It sounds true. But what does God tell us? Now, God says that Jesus spoiled principalities. Remember, we read that in Ephesians 6 about the types of demonic spirits. There are four classes, four types of demons. They're real. They're against you every day you wake up. Even while you sleep, they'll try to pierce your dreams. Don't get quiet now. I'm not going to preach a shouting sermon here. And he says, Jesus spoiled principalities and powers, demons. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Who did that? Who did that? Luke 10, 19, same Jesus said, behold, I give unto you power. Remember that? To tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy. Now, what I've done is identify who you are. 
You're God's soldiers. You may call yourself sinner saved by grace or whatever that is you want to call yourself, but God says you're a soldier. You have been recruited. Some of you are now in basic training. Others of you are in advanced training. In basic training, God won't permit you to go through no more than you can bear. And when you find yourself saying, I can't take it, that's not true. That's not true. Where sin amounts, grace will much more abound. Meaning, when Satan step up the power against you, God says, I step up the power too. <laughs> Come on, that's Bible. You see, the problem is we have to learn that that statement is true. And your faith in that statement will cause God to release his power in all of the situations you find yourself in. But the problem is we have to know what we have. I used to think, you know, that it took special kinds of people to do special things in God. And it took me years to open my eyes and realize that all of us are special in God. And that we have the authority and power. Come on, say amen. To do what Jesus did. And, and the Lord said when he was on this earth, he said, greater works than these shall you do. Now, most people see he was talking about the apostles, but he was not. They represented the modern day church. So he was talking about the body of Christ. Turn to Colossians 1.18. Let's show people who they are also. Colossians 1 and 18, please. But the first thing I needed to do was tell you who you are. Your identity has everything to do with how you walk in life. Your identity. So what do you mean? The image you have of yourself. You will always follow the image that you have of yourself. If you see yourself as a weak person, you'll act weak. I've met people in life, little guys, little guys. But on the inside of them, they didn't see themselves as little. They saw themselves as tough, bad, rough. And believe me, they acted like it too. Many of the bullies in school were the little guys. Many of the pushovers were the big guys. I've seen little guys come around and big guys look scared. Why? Because the big guy had this soft image of himself. And a little dude came to bully him, telling him, you can't beat me. And big old thing just come down, okay. You have to know who you are and you have to see yourself the way God sees you. You better hear what I'm saying. Because whatever God says about you is who you are. And you can walk in who you are. And if you walk in who you are, we won't have so many complaints in church. So many people asking others to pray. But you'll go in there as an opportunist and use that moment to show the devil that he has been defeated. Somebody say amen. You know, my leg's shaking now. The anointing already up here. Somebody say amen. Da, 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 da. Give God praise in here. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I want you to envision yourself now as a soldier in the army of the Lord. It doesn't have anything to do with how you're dressed. You can be a clean cat and still wage war. Dirty don't make you a soldier. Come on, y'all ain't saying nothing. I've been in the army and there were guys, Doc, they were so pristine. Everything was starch and iron and press, but they were soldiers. And then I saw the other guys, slobs. Listen, if you can't respect yourself, the devil won't respect you either. You all understand me. He will not respect you if you don't respect yourself. Self-image is powerful. You go into a place to pray. If you go in there thinking that, well, maybe it will and maybe it won't, it won't. But if you walk in there saying, God told me I can do this right here. And you lay hands in Jesus' name. You're going to see God move. 
See, it's the image. It's who are you? That's all I'm asking you. Who are you to yourself? Are you that prostitute God pull off the corner? Are you still her? Are, are you that drug pusher? Are you still him? Or are you the man that God spoke of in Timothy and also through the apostle Paul to the Corinthian church? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Come on, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. God said prostitution passed away. Pimping passed away. He said, now you are a new creature. Who am I? Tell your neighbor, who are you? You got to think about it. What you were is not what you are. Whoop, come on, somebody. But you are a vessel anointed, appointed, and full of the Holy Ghost. Shandal of a ho, shandal of a ho. Shout amen in here and quit letting people tell you otherwise. People walk around, uh, I don't feel like the Lord is with me. It's not a feeling, sugar. That's the problem. You're living in the physical world. It has nothing to do with how we feel. It's what did thus saith the Lord. What did God say about it? Come on. Isaiah asked a question. Whose report will you believe? I feel like I got the Holy Ghost. The power of the Godhead is in me and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Tell somebody I'm a soldier. Inequivocally, I'm a soldier. Say it again. Inequivocally, I'm a soldier and I do warfare. Come on, shout amen. Every time you pray, you're in a war. Shandalabahosi, shout amen. Woo! Come on, Shana the Bahata. Give God praise in this house. I'm a soldier and don't mind telling it. Hallelujah. You know, real soldiers. Real soldiers. God, I'd love for you to have met some of the real soldiers I fought with in the war. I was so proud of those guys. I was so proud. And when the going got tough, you didn't hear nobody complaining. Look up here. I'm going to use Pastor Viv for a moment. When the going got tough, Eloise, instead of us looking over, you black, I'm white. Well, you know I'm not white. But anyway, they got the message. When the going got tough, we were shoulder to shoulder. We were shoulder to shoulder. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? We fought like panthers to survive. But we had each other's back. The church has got to come to a place where you need your brother your sister and when they're down you pick them up don't put your foot on their neck you reach down and take on well come on and say come into my lot you got to get to that place where you don't have room for envy you don't have room for jealousy you don't have room for strife. You don't have room for foolishness. But you are a holy vessel. Come on, shout amen. We're in a war, people. We're in a war right now. And if you could just get a hold of this message, I believe some of you are going to rise up and show that devil his defeat. Why don't you high five somebody and say it's okay. Hey, 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 hey. Give God praise right now. Give the Father praise right now. Glory to Him. Glory to His name. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Ah. Watch this. Watch this. I want to show you a few things here. And I need your attention because I was speaking to Bishop. He came, he came to the house a few days ago and I was on the porch exercising. And he stopped. 
we spent quite a while together. So I said to him concerning this message, how everything started. But I said to him, but there's an evil middle. When you get married, it's joy, you know, and smiling at each other, the beautiful clothing, all the ushers and attendants, and it's wonderful. That's when you have a full-fledged marriage, not the courthouse type. Somebody say amen. Okay. If you did that, I'm not, I don't know who you are. I'm not knocking you, okay? But a full-fledged, I hope you had a full-fledged. <laughs> okay. <laughs> amen. But listen, after marriage, a new beginning starts. That's the evil middle. Once the final bell has rang, you've kissed your bride, consummated your marriage, now it begins. Now you begin to know who you really married. I better not go there today. I better move on. I got to move on. Amen. But there's an evil middle that took place after the Garden of Eden event where God said we'll make man in our image and after our likeness. And when you study, if you study in the, in the original Hebrew text, what God literally did was he made man. Now, get what I'm about to say. He made man by the breath of his mouth. But he formed him with his hand. Out of the dust of the earth. So we have made and formed. He said we will make him. In our image. After our likeness. So what did he do? He breathed a part of himself. Into clay that he had formed. With his hand. Clay. He took dust. Wet it. Formed a person. Who is the spitting image of God. Adam looked exactly like God. You want to know how the father looked? Find a picture of Adam. You'll know how he looked. Amen. Now, wait a minute. Put 1 Corinthians 15 and 45 up there. Watch this. This is something the church needs to know. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written... Notice the word first. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. Stop. Adam was not perfect. He was what we call morally innocent. The only way for him to be perfected was for God to put things in place and say, do this, but don't do that, so that he could exercise his will. If he exercised his will, he would become perfect. Still with me? Now it says the last notice, it never said the second man, Adam. Then there would have had to be a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so forth and so on. But he says, now there's another Adam. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. That means, the word quickening means life-giving. That couldn't be a real man like that, you say. Yes, he was. But the difference was, he was empowered with the Holy Ghost. Now, now watch this here. What was Jesus showing us when he put on this physical body? One particular thing he was showing us was this. How Adam was before the fall. How was Adam? Adam walked in the dominion and the power of God. Nature obeyed his voice. Nature. Adam could speak to nature. He could speak to rain. He could speak to wind. He could speak to clouds. Everything moved because he said, I will give you dominion over the entire earth. Everything. You're still in here. Adam, 
The reason them lions didn't eat him was because he had authority to talk to them. And he could walk in the midst of 50 lions and say, lay down everything with me. How do you know? How do you know? Because the Lord himself did it. When his apostles was in peril of drowning, he was asleep. You know the story. He gets up. And the reason he did it this way, he was demonstrating something. He was demonstrating to them what they were capable of once they had been born again. And they would become like Adam. They would get back the authority and the power to speak to nature and to speak to animals and to speak to circumstances, to speak to problems, speak to demons, speak to your own body. Tell your body what to do. You have the authority to do that if you dare to stand in faith. Somebody say amen. And so when he stood up, what did he say? The Bible said he stood up and he merely looked out into that storm and said, peace, be still. Now, if you look at it in the Hebrew, that's not what he said. He said, be thou muzzled. You know how you muzzle a dog so he won't bite? He literally muzzled that storm. And they looked at each other and said, what manner of man is this? They didn't understand. Now, you may trip on my next statement, but don't. The Bible said, as Christ is in this world, so are we. Who can believe that? You know why some men walk in so much power? They believe that. You see, the key to being like Adam once you're born again and releasing that dominion and that power from within is to speak in faith. I'm not going to get into the faith teaching because I'm dealing with battles now. But I'm showing you Christ came to be a demonstration for us to give us back what was lost, the authority and the power, and to tell you, now walk in it. Come on, somebody. And now all we're getting into is ceremonies and lemonade kind of preaching. And you're going to get it and you're going to your destiny and all kind of stuff to make you feel good. But then Paul said, be, a, be careful now in the latter day. They're going to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They don't want to hear the strong stuff. They don't want to hear get out of sin. They don't want to hear let go of people and forgive. No, they want you to talk about a destiny where you can't go nowhere when you're holding on to somebody else you got to let people go I got to preach it the way the Holy Ghost said preach it I feel it Eloise and you can't go nowhere walking in jealousy you got to let it go being envious of somebody because of their position in the church you got to let it go Woo! preach Holy Ghost hot kid of a bull shut up Give God praise in here. You've got to let it go. Are you still in here? Give God praise in here. We are in a battle. The things the Holy Spirit just said out of me are the very things the enemy uses against us. You're very quiet now. He's not coming to hit you He's coming to deceive you. He understands that. If I'm holding someone, I can't go forward. He understands that. When I'm not walking in God's kind of love, my faith doesn't work. Galatians 5 and 6 says, now faith worketh by love. Not slaving on my jaw, but treating me the way God wants you to treat me. That's how faith works through that God kind of love. I may not be the best looking, the best smelling. I may not have the greatest character, but you got to love me because God said so. Somebody shout and give God praise in this house here today. Oh, yeah, yeah, you got to love me. Oh, hallelujah. This is part, this is part of the war. You get it? This is part of the war. If you don't know the enemy, 
you can't successfully defeat him. Brother, hear what I'm saying? The more I learned about the devil, the more I could handle him. You must know the enemy. Most of you say, I want to know the Lord. Well, you better know the devil too. Because he's limited and you need to know his limitation. Let me drop a few bums in here. The devil cannot cross the bloodline. There is a bloodline. He cannot cross it. Now you say, well, how does he touch me? Because you broke the hedge. You broke the hedge. The Bible calls it the hedge of faith. And Paul said, above everything I taught you, you better take the shield of faith. He calls it a shield. In one place, it's a hedge. Same thing. It's a protection for you. And when you walk out of love because somebody called you a bad name or said something about you behind your back and now you can't speak to them when you walk down the aisle in church, I'm telling you, you're walking out of love. But the Bible said, do good to those that despitefully use you and those that talk about you and do all kinds of mess against you. Give them a drink of water. Take a little honey and do something sweet. Come on, Shandalabaha. Shout amen. Praise in this house. Amen. I'm following the Holy Ghost. Is that okay with you? God wants his people to realize they're soldiers and you got to take off that mess. Take off unforgiveness. Take it off. I don't care what they did to you. They didn't hang you on a cross and stretch you wide. They didn't make you bleed and suffer all night long. You never did that. When I was in the war complaining, God spoke to me through the word and said, you have not yet suffered unto blood. I shut my big mouth and took it. Come on and shout amen. You got to take you got to take boot camp if you take it you're going to make it you're going to graduate and move on up a little higher somebody say amen we got people want to move up but they don't want to be tested you got to be tested you got to pass the test before you can move up y'all better shout amen i feel the holy ghost you got to do what the holy ghost Woo! said to Let's go on with talking about warfare. Listen. Notice the sword of the spirit is what? The word of God. There's a sheath for the sword. The sheath is your spirit. God says, put the word in your spirit. So when it's time for battle... The word in your spirit can be released. Y'all ain't saying nothing up in there. Eloise, the word of God is capable of doing anything but failing. When we speak the word in faith, Jesus said, you'll have what you say. But you got to get it in here before you can know it. The way of the Lord is here. This is what the Holy Ghost said. The way of the Lord is here. And God said, this is my way. This is how I am. And I will not allow my people to be lost because of a lack of knowledge. That's what the Holy Ghost just said. Give God praise. Ha ha, terrible. Woo, wave your hand to the Lord. Wave your hand to the Lord. Ay, 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 ay. I see the book of Shakarababa. Alabokushiata. Neata. Reata. Lekisterika. I see the book of Osha. In me, saith the Lord. In me, saith the Lord. In me, saith the Lord. In me, saith God. When my children walk in me, and talk about me and love me. I'll do whatever they need me to do. I will open up the windows of heaven. I will pour out blessings. They'll not be able to receive. For you see, those that are obedient, I'll walk with you, I'll talk with you, and I'll be your God, and you shall be my children. For I, the Lord, am looking for children of obedience. I'm looking for children that will say, yes, Father, yes, I'll go. 
Yes, I'll stay. Yes, I'll walk. Yes, I'll talk. I'll do what it is you want me to do. I'm looking for those children. I heard him say, tell my people that they are in a war, but I'll give them victory if they stand in the power of my word and let the word be the authority and not the situation. Say it the Lord. Give God praise. Give God praise. Give God praise in you. Under the Hosea. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ay, ay, ay. Are you still with me here? I said, are you still with me here? This is the hour that I chose. In this hour, I come. I come. In the volume of the book, it has been written of me. I come. Yet I've been here. Yet again I come. And in this hour, I come to relieve you of the pressures you've been under my people. I come to relieve you of that that Satan have done against your mind. For today, there are many confused and know not which way to turn. But I say to them, look up and live. Know that the word of the Lord shall guide thee in this hour. Know what the word says and walk in it and you will not have the doubts that you're living with but you'll walk by faith and not by sight give him praise and glory now we're going to try to preach a little bit Woo. glory somebody say amen now listen the evil middle we're there here's the key now I'm going to I'm going to rattle off some stuff I've been just putting my notes down so that I could stay in line you know as teacher preachers get out of line sometimes number one God was pushed out one I want you to learn this when Adam fell and sinned you could say to me today God can do anything but fail and I will say back to you, that's true to a point. The point is he cannot come here and do exactly as he pleases in this earth. Turn to 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, please. He can't do it. It's not because he doesn't have the power. He doesn't have the legal right. You got that? He doesn't have the legal right. In whom the God, with a little g, notice, of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Talking about sinners. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is what? The image of God should shine unto them. Wait a minute. Go back to the words of God of this world. People. Adam legally lost it through deception. Satan took this world, dominion, and he does what he pleases. God can't just walk in and beat him down even though he's capable. There are angels could beat him. Yeah, angels could do it. But here's the thing. For God to get back in the earth, now listen, let me learn. He had to, to get his word in the earth. The word had to get in here. How was he going to do it? By finding a man and making a covenant with a man, a man. A man, one man. And he made that covenant with Noah to save eight people who he would use later to create an army. You're still here. 
Noah did his job. We know that. We know that. But later, he got another man of faith. Noah had great faith. He found another man who, in my estimation, his faith was not as great as Noah's. No, it wasn't. Noah never questioned God. Abraham questioned God twice. He asked God, how? 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 What? What? Sarah laughed at God. So their faith wavered. What I'm saying is sometimes our circumstances will cause our faith to waver. But it doesn't mean you're not in faith. Simply means it's wavering. When Abraham's faith wavered, God said, your servant, Eleazar, will not be your heir. But one that comes out of your loins shall be your heir. Why? Because God had a plan of salvation that involved a man from one generation to the next. Now, let me show you all something about the book of Genesis. People say Moses wrote the book of Genesis. He did not. God wrote it and handed it to Moses. Still in here. God wrote it and handed it to Moses when he was up on that mountain. He went up there twice. He came down with the Ten Commandments, but God gave him more. He was constantly going in the presence of God, and God gave it to him at some point. Still in here. But he's called the author of it. What is the book of Genesis? Why did I say that? The book of Genesis shows us the beginning and what happens at the very end. At the very end, something happens. What is that that happens? The family, the man, Abraham, got a few kids. One of his kids had 12 sons, which was Jacob. You're still in here. I mean, um, you know, you need to go down there and read that whole story. Because that's a big story down there. And Jacob came out with two sisters married to him and had 12 sons. Two sisters and two of their nurses. He had four wives. Can't do that today. Now, don't try that. God struck it down. He stopped it. Why did he allow it? In order to create a family. They created a family. Then went down in Egypt. This is the evil middle. A lot of evil happened between um, Noah and Abraham. A lot. I can't go into all this too much. But when they get in Egypt, God puts them in Goshen, the best grass, because they were all shepherds. Rich, too, when they got there. But the Egyptians took everything after another pharaoh came to power. Made them slaves because most people don't know what I'm about to say. One of these fellows in Egypt had a dream about a man coming that would usurp authority even over the throne of Egypt and Pharaoh. And said that man would come through his daughter. How about that? That ain't in the Bible. Look, there are books that are written about this historically that are not in the Bible. You need to study and find it out. You're still in here. And that was true. They have researched it and found it to be true. When Pharaoh started killing all the Jewish baby boys, that was his fear. That the Jews was going to give birth to a man that would literally dominate his throne. That's why he did that. He's still here. But where did he get the idea? Satan. Satan has been attacking every man down through the ages that he thought was the redeemer spoken of in Genesis 3 and 15. He attacked Abraham. He, he couldn't win because Abraham would never give up. He attacked Jacob. He thought Jacob was the man. Then Joseph, of course, now whether you know this or not, Joseph was the main man. It was not only Abraham. It was Joseph too. Still in here. Joseph and Jesus were very similar. Joseph was God's portrait. Get this, a portrait, a painting of Jesus. So what do you mean? I mean when his brothers were jealous and sold him into slavery before they ever put him in a pit to kill him, but their minds were changed by God. They took off his coat of many colors. 
when you study that coat, it was a coat of positioning. The coat that says, I'm the principal heir. It was the coat that said, I got power in this family. When Joseph came to look for his brothers who were supposed to be in one spot and they ended up in another because they were some runchy, no good guys. Old men, just runchy old men. Joseph was 17 years old, came to look for those old boys. When he got there, they saw him coming and said, this dreamer is coming. The thing they hated was he was a prophet and he prophesied that one day he had dreams that he would be over his whole family. And that's what God was doing, showing him his future. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Not only that, people, but, but also every time he got a vision or a dream from God, they got jealous and angry. And this is what I don't like in the church world. When somebody is appointed and, and most of the church love it, then you got three or four sitting over in a corner somewhere. I don't know why he got that position. I don't know what they see in her. You see, the reason God can't promote you is because you got the wrong spirit on you. And that demon is causing you to dislike, to hate and envy and be jealous of somebody that God used the leadership to promote. And if God promotes you, he said, the door that I open, no man can close it. Y'all better say amen. And when God gets a blessing, people could try to curse you. But I'm telling you, Balaam found out that when God has blessed you, ain't no man can curse you. They can throw curses, get witchcraft. They can get anything they want to get out of the graveyard. But when God's hand is on you and the blessing plan of God is upon your life, all they can do is bless you a little bit more. Every time they try to curse you, Eloise, they're going to bless you, girl. Somebody say amen. Anybody know that's Bible? Balaam, a wicked sideways prophet, was paid a lot of money to curse the Jews who God already had blessed. And every time he threw a curse, when it came out of his mouth, it was a blessing. The king that paid him said, I'm paying you to curse them. And every time you speak, you bless them. He said, I can't curse what God has blessed. When somebody say they put witchcraft on your dock, you know better. So tell them, throw that bone, throw that blessed chicken foot, throw anything you want to throw. But I got something you can't handle. Woo! I got the blessing plan of God found in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14. Come on, somebody. Let's talk about the battle. I, I got to move quickly now. You got to see something here. Joseph began. They took his coat, threw him in a hole. Said, we're going to kill him. Reuben, the son that was the firstborn, slept with one of his mamas. And Jacob dispossessed him. Gave his blessing to the knee baby and his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Are you in here? Listen at this. They sold him to Ishmaelites. They say Midianites and Ishmaelites. That was just a play on words. They were the same. Who are they? Abraham's descendants. His great-grandfather's descendants. Through the Egyptian wife. He had Hagar and Keturah. From Keturah, I believe it was, came Midian. Midian were people of color. They were the Ethiopians of today. Still in here. God was putting together an army. The reason it took God 42 generations was because his word had to get in the atmosphere of earth. And once it hit, it's a seed. And that seed falls into the earth and bring forth fruit. So the prophets had to keep speaking his word into the earth. Oh, I felt that in the spirit. Aye, aye, aye. You have to learn to speak his word into the atmosphere, no matter what it looks like, what you feel. That's why Paul came and said, hold to your confession of faith. Hold to it. Meaning you're going to go through some stuff. But don't speak what the stuff says. Speak what God says about the stuff. That's what Paul was teaching. You in here? Now watch this. They sold him into slavery. And whether you know it or not, Potiphar was a eunuch. 
He was the captain of Pharaoh's guard. And if anybody rubbed Pharaoh the wrong way, Potiphar had them killed. Yes, most times they were killed. Joseph, the most handsome, beautiful man, according to what I read, in almost the whole world at that time. Joseph was so well built. They said he had a perfect body. Was so beautiful that Zuleika, Potiphar's wife, held a big dinner party. So all the divas of Egypt that she knew could come to the dinner party. To see the slave, Joseph. Said them women saw him and were breathless when they saw him. I'm telling you, I did the homework, Eloise. <laughs> I don't know what he looked like, but to make those women breathless, wow. So they were breathless. Do you know? The Muslims even wrote a poem about him. That's how good looking he was. But his mother, Rachel, was the same way. So pretty. And then before her, Sarah, so pretty that two different kings took her from Abraham as a 65-year-old woman. Prettier than anything they had in their harems. So, you know, God ain't about making you ugly. He wants you to look the best you can look. The old school of church make you think you got to look like grandma and grandpa. Man, put on some clothes, dress yourself up, fix your face, fix your hair, and walk like you are a king. Come on, somebody say amen. You ain't no king's kid. You're a king. He said, I've made you kings and priests unto God the Father. That's what he said. Come on, get that kid out of there. That sounds good, but it's wrong. Now watch this. I'm about to throw down on Zuleika. Now just take it easy, ladies. Zuleika got so hot for him. She laid in her bed. He came in because God gave him care and authority over the whole house of Potiphar. Whatever he said went. Potiphar didn't even know what he had. This went on for days and days and days and days and weeks and months and years. It went on for years. She was after him for years. Now, I'm going to say something you never heard, but you might as well listen and know what I'm talking about. At some point, without the Holy Ghost, a man can only take so much of that. Look how, look how quiet they are. Look how quiet they are. See how quiet they got? Not my husband. <laughs> Brothers, don't say nothing. You're sitting by your wife, don't say nothing. Don't say one word. Stay cool, Terry. <laughs> Stay cool. But they, 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 <laughs> they see a mandingo warrior like Terry. <laughs> It's going to be a problem. <laughs> it's going to be a problem, brother. <laughs> I'm telling you. Most people think that, that it was just the devil. Oh, the devil had Joseph put in prison. The woman lied and said he tried to get in bed with her. No, first of all, what you need to know about Potiphar, I started to say earlier, Potiphar was a eunuch. Know what a eunuch is? They castrate them. They do not function sexually. But in my study, I found out they had harems of women and multiple wives. Don't ask me why. Because it didn't tell me why. If you can't function, why you need all these women around? <laughs> what I'm trying to show you is Zalika had a problem. <laughs> Howard, she had a problem. All this man in there. And Potiphar couldn't do anything. See, I used to think of her as a bad woman till I studied about Zuleika. 
And I found out that she was a woman of high standards, but she couldn't handle what she was looking at every day. Come on, somebody. So she lied and said when she reached and grabbed hold of Joseph, she had him. She had him. She had that brother. That brother's, that brother, not on my watch. He, put, he pulled that thing off and he slipped out. All he had on was a loincloth and he running out of that man. Listen, listen. Satan thought that Joseph was the seed God spoke of in Genesis 3.15. He thought he had him when he put him in that hole uh-uh. God said, no favor going to get you out of here. Favor picked him up out of that hole. Then when, when they sold him to his cousins, they thought they had him because there was a need for slaves in Egypt building all those pyramids. They were after slaves. So here he comes in. Instead of being a slave outside, God put him in the house of the man that stands next to Pharaoh. Why? Because he was an image and a portrait of Christ. He lost a coat. What did Jesus lose when the soldiers took him? A coat. Are you still in here? Hello? Joseph was put in a hole typifying Jesus being put in a tomb. You still in here? Now, he's going somewhere though. He's in the prison. This is the evil middle. He's been suffering now. Suffering. He's been in there for 13 years now. He's 30 years old. Almost, he's 27 when he goes in that prison. 27. Now he's hurting. God put him in prison. I'm going to say something. God in boot camp will allow us to get into situations that's going to confine us for a while. Oh, you're not saying nothing here. Yes. Yes. But it's for our good. When I went to boot camp, we were confined for eight weeks. We couldn't go outside the perimeter unless the sergeant said or the captain said you can go. It was such a confinement with all those hard heads up in there. My God, I'm telling you, testosterone in the morning, testosterone in the noonday, testosterone at night. You're sleeping with testosterone. You're sick of it. We were confined. Confined. Some of your brothers been there. We were confined. But it was for a purpose. They abused us. They mistreated us. They put the hurt on us. You hear what I'm saying? They put it on us. Had me mad at them. Because of the way they did us. They hurt us. I mean, they dogged us. But when I got to the war in Vietnam, I got so thankful for the dogging I got in boot camp because they was getting me ready for war God's getting us ready for war when you're in boot camp you're being prepared for the next level of warfare you better hear me demons came stronger and stronger after me as I grew in grace the little demons I thought were tough they weren't tough no they weren't tough as I grew the, t the trials and the tribulations grew along with me you all better learn from this apostle. But you know what? I never gave up on God. And God let me know he was with me through all of that. Now, this is the evil middle. I'm going somewhere. What was all of this about? For Joseph to be put in the throne with Pharaoh. Learn this truth. Once, I'm not going to go through all of that. He got put in the throne room. He became prime minister, second only to Pharaoh, sitting at his right hand. Where does Jesus sit in heaven? Now, what was Joseph supposed to do? Redeem his family from that great, great famine that was in the land of Canaan. He had to redeem them, then Feed them and protect them till he died. But they stayed there long enough to go from a family of 70 to a nation of three to three and a half million. That was God's army. Out of this nation was coming Jesus. Now, what was this about? Learn this. 
All of these 42 generations, Satan attacked one prophet after another, thinking they were the seed God spoke of. When Jesus got here, I'm abridging it now, I'm cutting it short. When he got here, the battle had been raging. If you study the history of the Jew, I don't think there's another country, I know it's not, that's been attacked as much as them, been killed out as much as them from one century to the next. Those people have suffered like black folk have never suffered. One generation to the next, one country after another, attacking, spoiling, destroying, because they got in disobedience. That's why. But Jesus had to come through there still. And there were some things happened that looked like he would never get here. I won't go into that. But when he showed up, the angel came to Mary. You know the story. Watch this. And once he hit 30 years old, even though he said at 12, I must be about my father's business. At 30 years old, he gets out and starts to minister and pick his disciples. And he picked a pretty runchy bunch. Did you all know that? Peter would kill. The sons of thunder would burn up a city with women and children. Judas was a thief. Nathaniel was a politician that thought he knew it all. He didn't get no, no great men. He got the type he knew would believe. It ain't about what you were. Will you believe? Once he picked them, watch this. And he went to get baptized. All those 42 generations, the devil were looking for this redeemer, the seed of the woman, the seed of the woman. Notice the seed of the woman, meaning a man will not cause her to be pregnant. God's spirit impregnated her. That's why it's called the seed of the woman. And Mary received by faith the word of God and it impregnated her. I can't go into that right now. But once he got 30 years old and went to get baptized, what happened? Heaven opened up while those disciples are standing there. And a voice comes down out of heaven. This is my beloved son. In whom I'm well pleased. What was God saying? You ready for this? God didn't have to say that. I used to think he told that to the disciples to convince them. No, ma'am. That is known in theological circles as the announcement. He was announcing to Satan. You fought me for 42 generations. But you didn't succeed. I got him here. <laughs> Come on, say amen. That's what that was. Man, God, listen, God got it going on. God's a warrior. He is a warrior. He was literally thumbing his nose at the devil saying, you tried, but you failed. Got him here. Now watch what the devil does, though. He hounds the track of Jesus. He does everything to get him. You know the story of the crucifixion. If I was here to talk about it, I'd give you, but I want to give you something else. Better. Better than just that, because you know that, but you don't know this that I'm about to tell you. Let, let me give you the verse for what I'm about to tell you. And I, I believe this will bless you all in a special way. Let's, let's go over here to Jude. Jude 6 and 7. Would you give me that? See, I took this to show you this battle of the ages and God's had this battle for 42 generations just to get Christ here. The battle was about stopping Jesus from coming to the earth. That's what it was about. If you want to see what the scripture says about him, I'll give you the verse. Said in whom? No, not there. Uh -uh. No, 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 no. Is that what I said? If I did, I said it wrong. I said Jude. I thought I said Jude 6 and 7. Jude 6 and 7. Watch this. And the angels which kept not their first estate. Remember the last time I was here. I told you angels came out of their spear, their ram. Remember that? Their habitation. And began to walk among men and have sex with who? The daughters of men. I know a lot of people, I don't know. You don't have to know. The Bible said it's true. Said, 
But they left their own habitation, meaning the spirit realm where God assigned them. And it says, God has reserved these angels under everlasting chains of darkness till the great judgment day. See, it's, it's all in there. Wait a minute. I'm not through yet. We're going somewhere else now. Get ready back there. First Peter 2. I'm sorry. Second Peter. Second Peter 2 and 4. Watch this, people. Learn this. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, notice it said having sex with women was what? Sin. But he cast them down to hell. He delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto what? Judgment. Give me another one here. First Peter 3 and 19. By which also, here's my text. He went and preached unto the spirits in prison. He is Jesus. When you read spirits, now some of you have Bibles with cross references. And if that Bible tell you that he was preaching, I read this in a Bible. He was preaching to lost souls that were in hell. Then that theologian lied. If you study the New Testament, you will never see the word spirits used of a man or a woman. Never. They always are called souls. S-O-U-L-S. Souls. Spirits is a reference to angels right here. Jesus went. Remember the other verses said those angels in where? Hell. Right? Did you hear me? Where were they? They are reserved in hell under chains of darkness. But he went down there. When? When Satan put him on that cross. Now listen to me, people. Yes, God wanted Jesus on the cross. Yes. But who was behind it? Satan. Once God announced that Jesus was the one that was going to bruise his head, meaning was going to crush, crush his head. He decided he had to get him, so he got in those religious people like they do today. And they attacked him, and they crucified him. You're still in here. Satan thought he had gotten rid of Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Le leave this, and I'm going to come back to this. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, brother 8 and 9. I'm getting close to what I want to say here and close out on you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Let's see this here. Which none of the princes of this, go, go back, go back to the seventh verse. <clears throat> but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. What he's telling you here is God <clears throat> had a secret. He was keeping something from Satan, which is easy because Satan is deranged. Amen. It is. The Bible said his wisdom has been what? Corrupted. Now, God says, I have a secret. The secret is the plan of salvation and how it actually works. Satan didn't know it. He didn't understand it. All of you think the devil's smart and wise. He is not. He's a spirit and he can know things that you don't know, but he's not wise. The Bible said so. Stick with the Bible. You still in here? Now, he said, the devil did not know the wisdom of God, which God hid from him. What was the wisdom of God? Go to the next verse. Which none of the princes of this world knew, the, the natural princes, neither the spiritual princes knew what was going on with crucifixion. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Saying if the devil knew what the cross really was about, he come shunder, he never would have crucified him at that cross. When he put him up there, he thought he had gotten rid of Jesus. You better learn this. He thought, and I'm sure the demons were dancing. They were rejoicing that they had finally got a hold of the seed. And, and now we killed him and he'll never do what God said. But he didn't know. This is what he didn't know. Jesus, because he was sinless, he could not die. Hello. I want to say it again. He did not have Adam's nature in him. 
The only way we die is because we are born with Adam's nature and that's what causes us to die. Hello? But Jesus was born of the word of God. He had the nature of God Almighty in his body. Come on, shout amen. I'm about to dance again. And, and the devil was so stupid and blind, he did not know that. So he waiting to kill Jesus. And Jesus said, uh, no man taketh my life. But I lay it down. Oh, come on. He was saying, you can't kill me, baby. You can't get rid of me. He's saying, I got to go when daddy is ready for me to go. And then the Bible said, he got down in that garden. And right there, he began to sweat. And great sweat, droplets like blood. Even one theologian or show said it was blood bleeding out of his pores because of what he had to endure. And he bled. And finally, he said, your will be done. And when he, oh, 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 come on, when he got up and they beat him, tore him apart. I did some studies on that. One day I'll come here and teach on that part. They tore him up like you wouldn't believe. The, the movies don't even show what was going on. But I got it in the manuscript. I got it in the book of Isaiah. And I seek a whole set time. Here's what Satan didn't know also. When he took the sins of the world upon himself in the garden. And he came out. The sins of the world had begun to take an effect on how he looked. He was weighted down with them. And when they crucified, beat him so bad and crucified him, here's the key. The cross was a doorway. A doorway. Death was the opponent God used to take him into hell. His spirit into hell. That's exactly where God wanted him to be. Ooh. See, the battle is raging. The battle is raging. Ooh. Ooh. Got your enemy, Satan, in your backyard. Down there. Satan's kingdom once was in hell. See, there are five different compartments of hell. The only one you all ever hear preach about is the fire. But there were four others. I did a teaching on that once and showed MEC Miami what was really going on. Okay, you're still with me. One compartment, Satan had his kingdom in it. And the Lord, he didn't go where the fire was. No, he went in that other compartment. And there he was. Three days and nights according to the Jewish calendar. Watch this. God's sitting up in heaven now. Watch this. God's sitting in heaven. God looks at him. There is a supreme court of heaven. The heavenly lawyers come in. Reviews the case. There are angels that help God rule up there. Watchers are in the earth helping him rule here. They look over the evidence. And then they says to the father, this is what the evidence says. He's been down there three days, three nights. God Almighty says, as he picked up the great judgment gavel and struck down, it is enough. Holy Ghost up in heaven leaps out, comes down. Faster than a speeding bullet. <laughs> With more power than a locomotive, brother. He's zoo, coming down in hell. Fell upon that dead spirit. Brought it to life. Jesus rose up in hell. Hell lit up. One of those demons said, Lucifer, there's a light in hell. Lucifer said, there's no light here. But here that light comes walking down. And the light shineth in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. Couldn't stop him. The Bible said he went in according to, put it up there, brother, Colossians 2.15. He walked into the chamber of hell, the headquarters of Satan. And got a hold of him. Most people think he just went in there and just, give me the key. No. Bible said he spoiled 
Satan is included in the principalities and powers. What he did was, if you translate that, he made an open show of them. He put them to shame with his cross. He made them look stupid and ignorant because he's sitting right there and they thought they had him, but God had him where he wanted him. And once he got a hold of Lucifer, Lucifer was holding on to the ancient powers. He had the keys of death and hell and the grave. And Jesus got a hold of him like a wrestler and slammed him down and put his foot on his head down in hell and reached in grabbed the keys of death and hell and the grave and rose up and said I am he that liveth come on somebody I'm alive forevermore isn't that what he said I'm here to tell you he put a hurting on that devil Woo! come on shout amen then in my conclusion I know I've been long but it took a minute he went and preached to the souls which were fallen angels why did he preach he was telling them you did all of that to stop me from coming but I made it that's what he was preaching I made it I made it and the plan of redemption is in full swing now come on somebody that's what he had to tell them Woo, come on I got it I got it. He preached to them fallen angels. And if you live, you go with God in the rapture. And if God allow us to view the white throne judgment, you're probably going to see those boys come from under chains of darkness and be judged. You just don't get lost. <laughs> be left. This is a battle that took on phase two now. And we're it. We are it. We are God's weapon to redeem lost men back to God. We're it. All this playing we do, we need to get into warfare. Come on, somebody. Say amen. Get into war. I'm going to read this and I'm through. I'm going to read the weapons that you have. Here are the weapons God gave us. He said in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty through God for pulling down strongholds. Watch this. Number one, prayer. Jude 20. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. God said you can build yourself up like a battery. You can build up and build up. You can pray in the Spirit and pray in the Spirit. I remember once I was praying in the Spirit for four hours. I prayed longer, but that time it was four and I entered into a case with demon power and them fellas had to move because I built myself up. The next thing he said, James 5 and 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Then he also said in Romans 8 and 26, now the spirit helpeth our infirmities for we know not what to pray for as we ought, but he helps us with intercession and with groanings that cannot be uttered. Now I'm just going to read the rest and I'm not going to tell you what it means. Fasting is a weapon. Turn that plate down every week. Believer's authority found in Luke 10, 19 is a weapon. Your authority works. The God kind of faith found in 1 Peter 1, 1, Romans 12 and 3. God's dealt to every man the measure of faith. And Peter said we have this like precious faith. Then we have the indwelling power of the Holy Ghost in John, St. John 4, 4. Then we have the ability in Romans 4, 17. This is a weapon to call those things that be not as though they were. Then we have the nine gifts of the Spirit. Three gifts that say something. Three gifts that reveal something. And three gifts that do something. The nine gifts. All this power. All these gifts. But I left one out. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 is a weapon. But love never faileth. Tongues are going to cease. <laughs> Knowledge is going to vanish. That's what Paul said. But love never faileth. Would you stay in love? Never faileth. Aye, aye, aye. I 
hallelujah worship just a minute you don't mind I know I was long I usually stop at an hour but it was just too much hallelujah hallelujah anyone remembers that old song love lifted me love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me oh love lifted me i said love lifted me oh yeah when nothing else could help love lifted me some of you been in a traditional church huh <laughs> i said love come on let me see move your lips love yeah yeah say it when when nothing else I said love, that's the love of God we we're talking about. I said love, lifted me, yeah, love lifted me. Oh, when nothing else could help, it was love lifted me. All oh, heads about right now. If you're not saved, this is an opportunity to get over on the Lord's side. We're in a battle. Some of us, our armor is really banged up. But we're still moving. And God's power is keeping us going, I want you to know. Father, today, I pray for those that have heard the message. And the babandile photo. Rahandile kisutara. Rabango Lisiato in Makalakasti do Bangile Kosiria. In this hour, saith the Lord, I will move in the midst of thee, my people. And those that have asked me for healing, the manifestation shall begin here today. Even those that have said, I don't have faith, it will begin here today. As you begin to rejoice, praise my name. I will release that power in your body and healing shall manifest here today as the spirit have said to the church begin to worship it I said love oh, come on say it church nothing else Nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Begin to worship the Lord. God said, if you start to worship Him, to praise His name, 